In February 2023, the California Bar gave us as the third essay, a hypothetical in the area of landlord-tenant property law. It was a fairly straightforward hypothetical involving a commercial property. The following debrief talks about that. If you find it helpful, please help us to grow this channel by sharing it with anyone you think could benefit from it. And if you would like earlier access to these debriefs, go to our website www.barsecrets.com and enroll in our free program, CalBar Updates. There you'll also find debriefs to some past bar exams. We are on to question three from the February 2023 bar exam. This was the last question on Tuesday morning. I see three calls. What claims, if any, may Tuan reasonably assert against Leo? That is pretty much a dead giveaway. On the California bar, the tradition is that if you see a T name and an L name, we're talking about landlord and tenant, and we're in the area of property law. I'm going to glance at the, the sentence above that to make sure I'm right. It says, Tuan decided to sue for damages based on his rights under his lease with Leo. Yes, squarely in property law, landlord-tenant. Call two, what claims, if any, may Tuan reasonably assert against Annika? I don't know who Annika is, so I'm not sure what that one is about. Call three, what counterclaims, if any, may Leo reasonably assert against Tuan? So call one is the tenant against the landlord. Call three is the landlord against the tenant. And call two, eh, we'll have to find out. But look at what an advantage I have having figured out the narrow area of property law this is. Now I can have in my mind my organized final outline of property, particularly the area of landlord-tenant. And in my organization, that's on one page. So let's take a look at that. Okay, let's get to property law in our schemas. And let's focus in on landlord-tenant, since I know that's going to be the the big area of issue in at least two of the three calls, probably all three. Under landlord-tenant, what do I need to have in mind? I need to type the tenancy right off the bat. I need to think about what the tenant's duties are, what the landlord's duties are, and then frame it in terms of remedies for the landlord if the tenant breaches. Often we have an assignment and sublease issue in a property hypothetical. I don't know if that's what's going on with Annika. Um, we'll have to see in the hypothetical. But then there are other, there are more detailed issues in each of those areas. Under tenant's duties, under landlord's duties, those landlord's duties provide defenses for the tenant if the landlord sues the tenant. So the landlord's duties include delivering actual possession in good repair in a majority of jurisdictions. They include the doctrine of quiet use and enjoyment and the warranty of habitability. Under quiet loose use and enjoyment, I need to think about total eviction, partial eviction, constructive eviction when the premises are uninhabitable and the detail that I know about each of those constructs. When must the tenant vacate in order to get a remedy? When can the tenant just immediately break the lease without being in breach? All this detail 
is in my active memory when I go to take my bar exam or my property law exam in law school. Constructive eviction, there are elements. Under constructive eviction, the tenant has to vacate within a reasonable time and his obligation to pay rent is then excused. So if we have a partial eviction here, I need to figure out whether it's by someone with superior title or not. When I think about the landlord suing the tenant, generally that's because the tenant has failed to pay rent. That's an unlawful detainer action. If I want to think about this in terms of defenses for Tuan, to the action by the landlord, then I have to think about the fact that the landlord had a duty to mitigate, that he breached quiet enjoyment, or he breached the implied warranty of habitability, or perhaps there was a retaliatory eviction. Those are the major issues I have in mind as I start this fact pattern. Okay, let's see what we've got. We have Tuan selling antique furniture. He signed a 10-year lease for a warehouse owned by Leo at $1,000 a month with a start date of January 1. All right, I need to type the tenancy. There's a 10-year lease, so it sounds like it's a tenancy for years. Yeah, I know there's a $1,000 a month payment, but there's a 10-year term on that lease. The warehouse would be used to store Tuan's inventory. They're telling you it's a commercial use. And that would mean that the warranty of habitability would not apply. Now sometimes the Cal Bar gives you one like this and then tells you that the tenant moved a cot in and started staying there and cooking his food there. That changes the scenario. We'll see if that happens here. But right now it's a commercial lease and I have to tell the grader that the warranty of habitability does not apply to commercial leases. When Tuan attempted to occupy the warehouse on January 1, he discovered Annika there pursuant to her validly executed lease, which was not due to end until January 31. Couple of issues raised by that sentence. One is that the landlord failed to deliver possession. In the majority of jurisdictions, that would be a breach of the landlord's duties. It would be a breach of the contract, the lease contract. If the landlord is at fault, then the tenant's rental responsibilities end, even if he still has possession of part of the property. This landlord is at fault. He already had someone with a valid lease. So Tuan could sue for breach of contract and collect damages. Landlord failed to deliver possession. In the majority of jurisdictions, that would be a breach of the landlord's duties. It would be a breach of the contract, the lease contract. The other thing is that Annika has a validly executed lease. Annika has superior title. That means that Tuan could get abatement. He could get a reduction in the rent proportionally. So it goes on to tell us that Tuan then immediately rented another almost identical warehouse from Bruno on a month-to-month -month basis for $1,500 a month. Sounds like Tuan is not giving up on the lease yet. So his damages from this partial eviction would be the $500 that he has to pay extra to Bruno, right? He was going to pay $1,000 to Leo. Now he has to pay $1,500 for that month. He can claim the difference between what he would have paid and what he's having to pay to cover in terms of damages for this breach. And the rent he was going to pay to Leo is abated by $1,000 for the month in which he has been partially evicted. 
In any case, I'm going to tell the greater that Tuan has attempted to cover. He has attempted to mitigate his damages by renting on a month-to-month -month basis an equivalent warehouse space. So then it goes on. When Tuan returned to Leo's warehouse on February 1st, Annika told Tuan she was not leaving until May 31st. Now that's interesting. We aren't told that her lease was formally extended. So she is a holdover tenant at this point. That's another issue to raise. Is this now the landlord's fault? He's still in breach in a majority of jurisdictions because he failed to deliver possession. So in the majority jurisdictions, the landlord would need to evict Annika in order to honor Tuan's lease and not be in breach. In a, majority, in a minority of jurisdictions, Tuan would have to evict Annika himself. So now when Tuan visited the warehouse on June 1st, he discovered that Leo had stored equipment in the warehouse that made 25% of the space unusable. Another partial eviction. Tuan refused to take possession and informed Leo that he was terminating his lease immediately. Can he do that? Yeah, he can do that. After all, this is, again, a partial eviction. The landlord is at fault. He's taken 25% of the space. So Tuan's rental responsibilities end even though he still has access to 75%. You can also analyze this as a constructive eviction. The landlord is at fault, and I would argue that 25% of the, the property lost is substantial interference. The tenant has to vacate within a reasonable time. No problem, he never took possession and then his obligation to pay rent is excused. Now note that as to Annika being a holdover, what the landlord is going to want to argue is that at that point she was a trespasser and it was Tuan's responsibility to get an injunction to get her out of there and that he is not liable for damages. But it goes on. The next day, Leo retook possession of the warehouse and placed for rent signs in several windows. He's trying to mitigate his damages when he claims that Tuan breached. Shortly after Leo, shortly after, Leo executed a 10-year lease with Juanita for the warehouse at a monthly rent of $500 with a start date of July 1. So he's rented the place out. He isn't sitting there building up his damages. But I'm going to need to deal with the fact that he's renting this thing out for $500 a month, half of what he was asking Tuan for. And Tuan is having to pay $1,500 a month for equivalent space. So what's going on with that difference? Then it says Tuan rented Bruno's warehouse from January to June. He later signed a new lease for nine and a half years, starting on July 1 with a monthly rent of $1,500. That's Tuan's attempt to mitigate his damages and to cover. And he's having to pay $500 a month more than he would have for the lease. So the landlord is going to claim that he has lost $500 a month for the term of the lease. Tuan is going to claim that he's having to pay $500 more than he would have for the term of the lease. That's what's going on with the damages that each would be asking for. So now your problem is to analyze Tuan's claims for breach based on failure to deliver possession, partial eviction under the under quiet use and enjoyment, and by holder of superior title for the first month, 
but then with a holdover tenant there for the rest of the time. Okay, and then constructive eviction when the landlord takes 25% of his leasehold away from him by storing his own stuff in there. The landlord is going to say, he didn't pay me rent, he owes me rent for the term of the lease. How are you going to come down on all this? My analysis would be that Tuan has the better arguments all the way across the board in a majority of jurisdictions. I also want to remember to tell the grader that because this was purely a commercial transaction, commercial real estate, that the warranty of habitability will not apply because that's for property used for residential purposes. So we have to rely on the warranty of quiet use and enjoyment and the remedies available there. That's a lot of issues. I think call one is the largest call for me in the way I would organize my answer. Call two, Tuan against Annika, he could evict her. He could institute an unlawful detainer action in a minority of jurisdictions once his leasehold begins. And Leo against Tuan, in a majority of jurisdictions, he doesn't have much going for him, does he? He failed to deliver possession, and so and then he constructively evicted Tuan from 25% of the property. And so he is not going to recover much. In a minority of jurisdictions, it may be a different story. But notice what a narrow area of property law this is and how knowing these concepts, even on the level I've discussed here, would get you a passing score in an answer to this one.